Wait for it. Wait for it. Hey, are you crazy? Wait sci-fi? for it. Wait. Yep, yep. Well, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans. It's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just a couple of nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. There ain't nobody as dysfunctional as us, and we wear it like a badge of honor. So uh, without further ado, we're going to let our guest, the legendary game designer and creative entrepreneur, Mr. James M. Ward, introduce himself to our listeners and viewers. Yeah, okay. And JR knows that I hate being called legendary. I don't feel legendary at all. <laughs> but legendary. I, uh, I started writing um, in 1974 for TSR and Gary Gygax. And I came up with the first science fiction role-playing game. That was fun. Um, Gary and I were playing on his porch, D&D. And I said, Gary, you absolutely have to do a science fiction version of this D&D stuff. And he says, you know, Jim, I don't really have time right now. I'm working on a bunch of adventures. Do you think you'd have time to do that? Well, my mom didn't raise any stupid kids. <laughs> I said, absolutely. And so I did Metamorphosis Alpha. And then we got a couple thousand letters saying they really wanted a planet-based um, version of a science fiction role-play game. And so I, I invented Gamma World, which was the first apocalyptic game. And so I've been writing short stories and rules ever since 74. And, and I'm a rules. Rules, yeah. Justins. So, you know, that's kind of how I got my first start writing. I, I sent a lot of suggestions to the um, author. And I'm like, you really, like, you should write this story and this story and this story in your world. And he goes, you're hired. Write those stories for me. Oh, my. That's cool. That's that's how a lot of uh, a lot of people get suckered. I mean, roped in. I mean, convinced to embrace various career paths. Inspired. <laughs> inspired to pursue this, this pursuit of writing. Yes, yes. Secondary. There That's how I suckered Nick into his first short story publication. Oh, um, oh so you I, I, bash. <laughs> I was like, I just really just want your opinion about Ranger stuff. And he's like, that I can do. And then when it was done, I sent it to him and says, now edit it because you're the co-writer. Because, <laughs> you know. The, I'm what, not a what good Rangers editor. <laughs> you were editing content, not grammar. Neither one of us do the grammar. That's why we have real editors for that. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And Microsoft. Yeah, I, I don't do. I would. Don't. So, if Go you ahead. guys want to know why Nick sounds so funny tonight, uh, he is sitting in a tropical storm, which could possibly turn into a tornado tonight, or a hurricane, or a hurricane. Yeah. So the the funny thing is, for this episode, normally we don't air them. With the exception of the Kickstarters, we, we record them about a month or so in advance. But um, because of scheduling conflicts, I put James's episode on the calendar as far as publication date. But we're actually finally getting around to recording it like this is, what, Thursday? And it's going out to you on Monday. So, you know, this is actually recent news this time when Nick's telling you about the bad weather he's enduring. Uh, all to become um, on the show and, and listen to this amazing author talk about his amazing collection of stuff. But before we... For the world... Before we can dive in, we have to tell you, dear listener, dear viewer, how we found them. I actually met James. Of course, I'd seen D&D stuff, but I didn't put a face to a name until James and I were both on the Sci-Fi Writers playing old school D&D podcast with Jason Onsbach, Nick Cole, Walt Robillard, and then uh, was it Matt, uh, M.A. Rothman? And, um, Jason there. Who? Jason. Yeah, I said Jason. There's somebody else we're missing. I just can't remember who. Oh, Andrew Perry? Andrew Perry, and there was another author from uh, from Hawaii that I can't remember his name. Huh. Anyway, there was a lot of people. You should go check it out. Those are all still up on the interwebs. Uh, and him and I were gaming together. He was the DM, and he killed me a lot. He said I killed myself, but I'm just saying he was the one, you know, rolling the magic dice. Yeah, yeah. So, Who put the sword in the portable hole, huh? Look, how was I supposed to know it was going to go nuclear boom? Yeah, there we go. Do you like when things go boom? Generally, when I can control the boom, yes. But apparently sticking a, um, what was it, a magical weapon in a bag of holding, those, those two aren't supposed to go together. Yeah. That's like oil and yeah, water. Position. Yeah, it was just not good. It, it ended my, my life. I got to roll a new character, though. No, I thought Perry brought everybody back. 
I did roll a new character, and then Perry brought me back after I'd already created a new character, which is where my dwarf Atropia came from. Yeah, we're uh, deep in the nerd now, unfortunately. It's oh, okay. Nerds need love, too. Okay. We'll be bored to tears right this second. Uh, you'd be surprised at the number of gamers in, like, there's all the Venn diagram of gamers and nerds and sci-fi and fantasy readers. The, it's almost a straight circle. So, uh -huh. we're good. so let's stir up a little bit of hate mail for me real quick. Okay. I have never played D&D. &D. No! That Nick, is you've got to stuff. fix this. So all right. I am not qualified to be a dungeon master, dude. Like, no, I got to go find one. I'll be happy. Like, I don't have that skill set. I will be happy to run. I'm a player. I can't run a game. He said he'd be happy to run a game for us, Nick, and we're just going to keep him to that. Uh, he's also, when he works on some of the new stuff, he's going to do some play tests here on our show. You heard it here first, people. Uh, oh, of course, that's so down. Apparently, the games don't happen overnight. He's actually got to, like, do math and stuff. It takes, like, six months to do a good adventure. <laughs> I started... I started working to help out the family when I was 14. Uh -huh. So you get an excuse, you know. I why did not really stop, stop working. Yeah, no, see, your, problem is, your problem is you're attractive. Attractive women don't play D&D. &D. Hey, there's so much. Change. Change. She doesn't yeah. know she's attractive. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I left the cat out of the bag. <laughs> Ugly child. I grew the beard, and now I'm, I'm kind of cute. Now, Nate, now James is going to get all of the hate mail from all the attractive women. It's like, I play D&D. &D. What's your problem, sir? Yeah, I'm attractive. I can just hear it now. Luckily, luckily, I can't get hate mail because they don't know my email address. Do you even know your email address? No, probably yes, not. Yes, I do. <laughs> Sorry, Stabby. She collects all the hate mail. Well, see, see, the other part of this is is James is a uh, technical luddite like myself, so he absolutely hates all things technological. Uh, he would still be using his DOS uh, operating system if we let him. Um, we did forcibly, Andrew and I forcibly took his um, Commodore 64 away from him to get him to upgrade to Word 97. Oh. <laughs> so, no, why would you do that? Hold on, hold on. So... Let's send all the hate mail to James's Twitter, which he has not been on since 2014. No, no, no Twitter for me. It's still active, James. It hasn't been published since you talked about GaryCon in 2014, but it still exists. I, I never put it up. So someone else put that up. Oh. I only do Facebook. Oh. So somebody else has a... No, he uh, doesn't, get some hate doesn't, he's completely doesn't have a presence on the Facebook. He's a treasure. Sure, needs to be protected at all times. For all of you on Twitter, if you feel like yelling at Twitter. So, James, are you ready for the religion question, sir? It is a podcast tradition that cannot be broken. Okay, I'm listening. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Well, that's just nasty. Firefly for sure. I wrote a game on Firefly. Oh, you I'm did? Firefly you guy, did. yeah. What, uh, Shiny. Was it, uh, Weiss, Margaret Weiss did a Firefly role-playing game, and she uh -huh. said, hey, Jim, you got time to do an adventure for me? And Margaret Weiss paid very good money, and I said, sure, I can do that. And so I did a, a pirating adventure where they go to one of the planets in the solar system, and uh, and they steal some stuff. Nice, nice. Um, Love it. Was it the main character? Firefly episode, actually. <laughs> was it the main characters, or was it just in the world? No, it wasn't the main characters at all. They told me not to use the main characters. I still think I had a companion. That's the that's the girl that likes to mess around, right? Yeah. Yeah, I still have a companion, but I didn't use any of the, the original characters. So is it um, a D20 system for that game? Kind What's of, yeah. It's, you know, basically it's uh it's cowboys in space, of course. Right. And, uh, and so, yeah, yeah the... It's a simple, easy to play game. I don't even, I don't even think it's in print anymore. But, uh, but I enjoyed it, and, and I really liked the whole storyline, except when the guy died at the in the movie. Yeah, that was very poorly handled. Spoiler alert. Yeah, uh, Stabby finally watched that, and she uh, she now hates us all. Um, <laughs> so, because we're polytheistic over here at the Blasters Blades podcast, Game of Thrones, Wheel of Time, or the Lord of the Rings. Okay, they forced me against my will to read all the Wheel of, Wheel of Time books 
to do a big game, big card game. I hated it. I hated it. But, uh, you know, Game of Thrones, that's fun. I also did a miniatures game based on the Game of Thrones. What was the third choice? Uh, Wheel of Time, Game of Thrones, and Lord of the Rings is the, the final. Board of the Rings? Lord of the Rings. Okay. Well, Lord Tolkien. of the Rings was more Tolkien. fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tolkien. You know, Scary was really funny about Tolkien. He always told everybody he never read Tolkien, but he did. <laughs> he read it th through and through. And, of course, that's why you see a bell rock in the beginning of AD&D, &D, and it goes away when Tolkien threatens to sue him. Was it the Tolkien he estate was or was Tolkien still story? alive? No, it wasn't. It, the son was was the master of the estate. I don't know who's the master right now, but uh, yeah, they they've got a bunch of lawyers that work hard on keeping the trademark. Good for them. So now, because we want to prove and show the world that we are not knuckle dragging troglodytes, <laughs> sir, coffee or tea, and how do you take it? Oh, I use a raspberry tea that I really like a lot. And I give it as Christmas presents to my very good friends. Don't I, JR? It was very good. I'm not normally a tea person, but I liked it plain. I didn't even have to add sugar or nothing. Right. I didn't either. I really enjoyed it. I didn't like it cold, but I liked it hot. It was quite Yeah. The only other tea I've had like that uh, was put out by Tia Vana when they before they went under, which was a subsidiary of Starbucks. Mm -hmm. And they had one that tasted like big red gum. Oh, wow. in a tea form. It was delicious. It was Ooh. like peppermint and, and some other stuff. No, it's if you like big red gum, this tea was it was divine. So unfortunately, like I said, when they went out of business, I have not found a substitute. Yeah, there we go. You need to do Earl Grey too, buddy. Oh. That's pretty tasty stuff. Uh, I mean, I'll do Earl Grey or just regular Lipton's if I'm making like sweet iced tea, which is like Southern table wine we call it. Uh -huh. um, but since um, you know diabetes runs in the family. <laughs> Unlike I used to, I've been cutting back on some of the sugary stuff that yeah, I why? like yeah. loving. I've had it since I was four. Chamomile with lavender. Chamomile with lavender? You like that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, it, to, I call it, it's just relax. Of course, you call it what? I took it when I was trying to draw a comic book page. It got while I was drawing. Yeah, What's you also like a city called Relax. Okay. Is that a black tea? Okay. It's got melatonin in it. Oh, good. Well, how, how does that <laughs> keep him awake? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. It doesn't keep you no, awake. So, so he, he drank the tea uh, thinking it would just help him relax so he could finish the comic book. He, he relaxed, but he didn't finish the comic book. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> Yeah. I barely made it to the bed. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, wow. Okay, we uh, we did have a little bit of between Nick's uh, poor connection and everything else technical difficulties. You're only seeing the uh, actual um, artwork on the screen, uh, so this is going to be audio only, and we apologize. Um, you know, you can you can follow him on Facebook and look at uh, James's smiling mug if you really really want to. Um, but I'm going to throw it up on the screen for, for the rest of us who can actually see it. Uh, the art that comes with this collection. So we had you here to talk about your collection of short stories. And the art on this is, is amazing. It's a black and white image, if you're listening at home. It's a uh, wolfoid creature, hence the name of the collection, wolfoid, armed with a uh, bandolier of what looked to be grenades and a rifle of some sort. Yes. Um, it looks like it could be based on a P90, but, uh, you know, uh, loosely. And he's fighting what looks to be some sort of um, tentacle monster. And no, they're, they're worm creatures. Worm creatures? I love so these long worms. What's the story of this art? I, I mean, I, I know I love it. I know. It's a, it's an illustration in Metamorphosis Alpha. Um, it talks about grenades. And actually, that rifle, that picture is older than, than the P weapon you talked about. That wasn't out. Yeah. And, okay. uh, and so basically, um, wolfoids are one of the controlling intelligences on the Starship Warden. The Starship Warden is a lost colonization starship that's been out there 300 years, and other groups have grown up on the starship, and the wolfoids um, and humans contend for different levels of the ship. 
So the FN P90, which is um, a, a weapon, it's a submachine gun uh, made by Belgium. I uh, was actually, I just Googled it real quick, uh, made in 86 in development and adopted in 90. So I don't know when this picture was drawn, but. That picture right. was drawn in 76. So he was a trendsetter. He should sue them for stealing his design. <laughs> Unfortunately, Jim has passed away. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, it is. He it's, was a it's artist. Artist. Just a wonderful artist. And he was kind of a crazed man, too, because he he would he didn't like signing his art, and he would throw away the colored pieces of art. And he was, he was an amazing artist. So when I heard about that, I started giving him jobs where he couldn't throw away the art. <laughs> Why did he throw it away? He, he just was, he just always wanted to do better. And so the, the artwork that he had irritated him. So uh, sadly, the connection just dropped on uh, Florida where Nick is doing work stuff. Um, so he's interrogating ET and finding out where the moon base is. Um, and unfortunately, they just, they took out the signal and he's just, he'll have to report back to us when it's declassified next week. Yeah, let's hope his hotel room didn't get flattened. <laughs> well, I mean, when you when you don't let ET phone home, it gets really ugly. Yeah, there we go, there we go. So we'll just have to rock out solo. But he did he did dig the art. So um, with the title Wolfoid, does that mean there's werewolves in the story? You keep asking me that. No, nope, no werewolves. A wolfoid is a nine foot tall, intelligent wolf humanoid. See, but I had to ask you when we were actually recording, so you oh, could say that again, so somebody else could hear it. So the guests can hear it. So listeners can hear it. So uh, Wolfoid is the creature in the um, Gamma world. No, correct? Morphous is Alpha. Are those not the same universe, just one's oh land base? God, no, they're so different. Um, Gamma <laughs> world, the, the Metamorphous Alpha, uh, we called it a D&D dungeon in a can. It's a colonization starship that's floating out in space. But like I said, we got tons of letters, hundreds and hundreds, if not a thousand letters saying, we want a planet race version. So I was only happy to do it and uh, make Gamma World, which is an apocalyptic one. I, I take the poor Earth and I do five different types of disasters that uh, destroy most of it. And you live in what's left. I know I played the game with you, uh, with Nick on the sci-fi writers playing old school D&D. We did some Gamma World stuff. Yep. I don't know why I thought it was linked to the uh, metamorphosis. Like I, I thought they were the same universe for some reason. Well, they both have mutations, so that could that kind of link in your mind. And if you want to make your homebrew where they are linked at home, you do what you want to, but James says no. You're wrong. There we go, exactly. Do, do what you want to as long as you give him the money and buy the game. And the funny part is all of the inventions that I invented are, right. are coming true now. <laughs> oh, what's an example? Death rays. Um, plasma rifles, uh, 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 anti-gravity sleds, all that stuff is is being designed and happening right now. So I'm really kind of behind the times in my equipment design. <laughs> so you and Star Trek are inventing the future. Yeah, exactly right. Okay. So you have all of these stories in this collection. Yes. So... Uh, how many stories are in the collection for the listeners at home who, who haven't bought it yet? And you should. And I'll link it, the buy the link in the uh, show notes. I think there's 12. Okay. And, uh, uh, yeah. No, 100,000 words. Yeah. So it's probably about 10 to 12, depending on. Now, you're really, really good when you write um, short content at keeping it actually tight. I I can never get into a short story and not walk out at least 10,000 when they say they want uh, you know, six to 10, I give them 10 to 15. Uh -huh. um, you somehow manage to actually keep it really tight and still make it compelling stories. Uh -huh. I'm just not Indeed. good at being concise. I'm a professional writer. I regard myself as a professional writer. And when they tell me 5,000 words, I never give them more than 5,000 in five words because <laughs> I want every penny I can get as quick as I can get it. So a lot of it, it's just a range. Well, well, take that back. You came up through um, the traditional publishing, yeah, whereas right. I did indie. A lot of the indie um, anthologies, it's, you know, you get a range and then you're just getting a share of 
sales, right? Like the profit share model. So there's no benefit for long or short from my perspective, as far as that goes. Sure. But I, I, all of my stories, I was given a, uh, a, a, a deadline and a, a specific number of words I could play with. Okay. So that's what I did. So that's what, that's when, when you and I are working on a fantasy novel and you tell me, Jim, you have to have at least 2000 words in every chapter. I give you 2,001 words in every chapter. So I just counted um, on the sample page. There are 18 short, short stories that Oops. equal a... Sorry. Um, you know, you're fine, but it's still that 100,000 words because that's what you remembered. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, some of those are really tight. I know... <laughs> that's because you told me I had to have at least 100,000 words. That's what that's what sells and and what you need if you're going to get somebody to do an audiobook. But I know when my mom was doing the reading cuz you know Bayonet Books published it but that was you know you and my mom did all of that in the background. Um and so I know she said she had to read it a couple times cuz she kept forgetting she was supposed to edit cuz she liked the story so much. What a nice um, compliment. I really appreciated that. That is a good problem to have as a as an author to say that the editor forgot to uh edit cuz they enjoyed the story so much. Yeah, You're going to give him a big head. <laughs> no, I don't have that, dear lady. <laughs> He's covered. Already. He's covered. Um, so she likes particularly the dwarf story that you wrote. So do you want to tell us a little bit about one of that, that sure, story? Of um, so I did a role-playing game called Dragon Scales. And in Dragon Scales, you use a deck of cards instead of dice. And in Dragon Scales, there's this great big Grand Canyon canyon at the bottom of the canyon there's this ancient dwarven city. And there's only a few hundred dwarves living in a city that had millions long ago. And so this is a story about one of those dwarves who, who decided to chase down a legend. There was a legend of a famous dwarf, and he had a big hammer, and he had armor, and he had a big helmet. And they were all magically marvelous things to have. And so he said to himself, Wow, I'd really like to find that. So he starts searching the ruins of it. And during the course of the adventure, he finds horrible monsters and he has to deal with them. But he finally finds the mansion of that famous dwarf. And so he starts fixing the mansion just for fun. And he finds in the basement the secret door that lets him in to find the hammer of the dwarf. And so from the hammer, he gets clues to go into the uh, the canyon rifts and find caves where the other two things are. And eventually he wants to bring all his people and grow the city back to the glory that it was. And your mom liked it for some strange reason. You've got talent, sir. Yeah. <laughs> You, you actually challenged me. One of the, the anthologies you were going to put together was paired with a picture of a dragon that we found. And we were supposed to write, I think it was like less than a thousand word short story. That was the hardest thing I've ever written. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I wrote my master's thesis uh, for grad school. <laughs> and wow. then if, if I was long, they're like, oh, overachiever. When, you, when I was long for you, we're like, edit it again. <laughs> yeah. the, the idea that we had for that was, that you have, we have a full page picture, and on the other side, we have 400 to 600 words of a story. And so you have 96 pages, and you're just flipping and reading stories one by one, and they're, they're really short and easy to read, plus they have an illustration. So, but we haven't got that project out yet. Right. Um, but yeah, that's the, that, the, you and short content, you take that to the extreme with the, uh, the ability to be concise. Um, yeah, I think, I think yeah. part of it for you, it helps because you do what they call in media res where you jump right into the story. I think it helps for you that, that you're writing in worlds where you've got games. So the, yes. the world is already flushed out in your head. A lot yeah. of people are probably already familiar with it. Whereas if you're doing something entirely new, sometimes more explanation is needed. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Now, are all of the stories in this collection for... Um, are all of them for like g existing games you've written? Um, at least half of them are, but a couple are uh, novels that I wrote where I grabbed a couple chapters that were complete in themselves and, and used them as stories. And then there's a couple uh, one-pagers um, like I'm going to use in that 96-pager that 
um, there are one-page stories. One is about an elf army that gets destroyed by humans, and the other is about a horrible mushroom that takes over the minds of people. Oh, okay. All, all in 400 words. So did you include any more art in the um, in the collection, or is it just the cover? Yeah, no, I just did the cover. Okay. Um, I actually haven't read it yet. I did. I do have the copy now that it's done. Um, while uh, you were working on this with, with my mom, I was working on doing the last-minute edits for book one of the uh, the Wargate one we're doing. Um, you um, should tell them the name of that book, by the way. Oh, uh, Operation Kopesh, because I can now say that word because I used to mispronounce it horribly. <laughs> uh, and James would always correct me, and he thought it was hysterical that I got it wrong every single time. And I, and I um, sent him a Kopesh sword. He did. I actually have one that I used to uh, to make sure all the movements in that book were possible with that there sword. Go. There we go. Yeah. So It's an Egyptian uh, fantasy where a, a brigade of National Guardsmen gets transported back to a magical Egyptian past. And they have so, to survive and fight the bad guys. Yeah, basically an alternate dimension where the gods are real and they're messing with people's lives. Yes, exactly. So if you took Hercules where they were doing all the stuff in the show in the 90s that I love with Kevin Sorbo, uh -huh. just instead of the Greek gods, they went to see the Egyptian gods. Uh, and we stuck with them leaving in 04 because that's the time I was in the army. So all the stuff I knew, I didn't have to worry about like, oh, they changed this equipment or that equipment. I just used what I knew. Well, it's and, just wonderful uh, that his military training – just works right into the storyline. It's just terrific. Yeah, and the the other glorious thing about it is because we did National Guardsmen, they're every man. If they get it wrong, of course we knew that's not the real way, but they didn't know that. See, yeah, it's yeah, the perfect yeah. out of jail free card. Yeah, really. <laughs> so, um, is this going to be a standalone? I mean, I know there are a bunch of stories in it that are linked to your games. Is there going to be another uh, Wolfoid version two or volume that's two? A very good question. Yes. Um, I have this very good friend who says I have to have a hundred thousand words, and so <laughs> I've got a second set of of uh, short stories, but I'm only at fifty thousand words, so I have to add fifty more thousand. Um, but he's been keeping me busy on other things. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> yes, we've, got, we've, got stuff, we've got plans for world domination. I'm just saying, the man's not allowed to rest till he's a hundred. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be nice? We'll see what happens. I mean, you. you I, I talked to your wife when you, when you were in the hospital, and I told her you weren't allowed to die. I needed at least thirty more years of work from you, and she said, uh, "Yes, sir, Jr. Sir, we'll, we'll we won't let him die." That's so, funny. Yes, that is funny. Your I, wife is a very sweet lady. I so. tell many of my friends that they I have to go first. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Through their, so, their yes. so we don't want to get too too macabre. So instead, too we are going to uh, we're going to give you. I say that word wrong all the time, and you laugh at me every time. I can spell it though, so yeah, macabre, that. macabre. I don't know, whatever. It's what it's a word, that? people. I'm just the writer. I don't actually read the stories to you, so you're. Right. <laughs> we have professionals for that. There we go. Um, speaking of professionals reading the words to you, um, we are going to play the commercial for one of the anthologies where I have a short story in, and it is described by the editor as. Um, do I have Monster Within as an anthology? Oh, the commercial corrupted. How rude. Oh, no. <laughs> it was the one where the editor described it as King Arthur meets Columbine. I was going to play that commercial. Bummer. Now you'll just what? have to say it. Well, I don't have it memorized. So instead, uh, we will go with, uh, since this is airing in October, Zombie Pay. The government underestimated the outbreak. The best medicines couldn't stop it. Now, the dead are walking the streets, and they're hungry. Zombie Patient Zero is nine tales of flesh-ripping, brain-splattering mayhem from Bayonet Books, the boldest name in action and horror anthologies. From deep space, to luxury resorts, nowhere is safe. Zip up your hazmat suit and dare to find out how it all went wrong. Zombie Patient Zero from the deranged minds that brought you Contact This and Storming Area 51. Pick up your copy today in paperback or Kindle.
All right. Thank you for sticking with us through that commercial interlude. And uh, if the technology. That's wonderful was, commercial. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Michael Gallagher recorded that for us. He's uh, one of the authors who's got a collection in there. He or a story in the collection. He used to be some sort of audio engineer person. Like that was his day job. So uh, he used his skills to make the commercial. It was supposed to be a placeholder. He's like, now we can get a professional to record it. I'm like, that sounds pretty professional to me. Sold. Oh, really? So now hey, we use the commercial. Hey, Stabby Stab. What's yes. your favorite genre of, of writing? Horror and thriller. A little like bit of mystery. Yeah. <laughs> horror, thriller, and mystery? I see. So I'm currently reading, it's called The Five, and it's the life stories of Jack the Ripper's five victims. Oh, my. Before they... They were victims, yes. Cool. So it's, it's their, the story of their lives and how they came to be where they were when he got his hands on them. It's a pretty neat read. Um, I also have another one because I cannot sit through one book at one time. Uh -huh. I a little ADHD, so I bounce between a couple. Uh -huh. um, so the other one I'm currently reading is Then She Was Gone. Which is? So basically, um, she was the the main uh character was like in the spotlight like not not a celebrity but like everybody knew her and everybody in the town knew her and um one day she just disappeared and yeah. nobody could figure out why and it turns out that somebody had taken her and locked her in his basement isn't that great you notice girls hardly ever lock men in basements you notice that <laughs> Maybe if they did, they wouldn't wind up in basement. <laughs> Maybe yes. I had to when I wrote Deities and Demigods. I have to. I had to do the Cthulhu Pantheon by H. P. Lovecraft. So I had to read all his books in six months, and it scared the poop out of me. I was constantly looking over my shoulder in fear of old ones coming to get me. So um, when I was born. I had a lot of medical issues. I was born with a seizure disorder. I, by the age of 14, I had rheumatoid arthritis in my knees, hips, and lower back. But my seizure disorder was the big one. That one kept me in the hospital a lot because um, they couldn't find the right medication to keep me from going into seizures. Mm -hmm. This is back, you know, late 80s, early 90s, when they were still figuring out what medications did. Wow. And um, so... In the hospital, they had the TV on the little willy thing, and they would will it in and out of my room. So I'd get like an hour or so, and they'd will it to the next room, and they'd get an hour or so. So books were my escape. So I'd have my mom, who actually was a nurse in the hospital that I was always in. So every day when she would come to work, she would bring me more books because I'd just go through them so fast because I'm just laying there in bed with nothing to do. Yeah. And my love for the library and my love for books actually started with her bringing me the complete history of uh, Michelangelo. Oh, really? And that was neat. And seeing all his famous paintings, but also some of his not so famous paintings. And then she would bring me in something completely opposite of that, by bringing me uh, Stephen King's Desperation. Oh, wow. And so I was like, oh, I like this. This is yeah. exciting. What's going to happen uh -huh. next? Like, I really needed to keep going. And then the next day, she'd bring me another book, and it would be, you know, like The Princess Bride. <laughs> a wonderful so, story. It, it is a wonderful story. So my... I'm eccentric when it comes to my books. My mm -hmm. bookshelf makes no sense to anybody because yeah. you'll have, you know, a romance novel next to a horror novel right next to Desperation and then you have It and then you have, you know, some Danielle still girly girly thing that I still have not finished. Uh -huh. And then I have um, a book that was... Somebody told me it was good. I haven't gotten past for the first two pages. I keep Ooh. trying. I cannot get past the first two pages. Like, I don't know what it is, but it's called uh, Touched by an Alien. <laughs> and I try so hard to read this book. I'll take it to the beach with me. I take it on road trips with me. It's 
Nick doesn't let me drive on road trips. So I'm like, I'm going to read it this time. Two pages in, I'm like, who wants to play the license plate game? Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, uh, I started out on Tom Swift books in fifth grade. And that was fun for me. JR, what did you start reading? Um, I started reading. Um, so I was a voracious reader, but I hated to sit still inside. Uh, and then I realized if I read the wrong things, I could upset people. So I got in trouble in third and fourth grade for bringing in Stephen King, which I could read and did, but I didn't really enjoy him. But you start reading Carrie and it and, and all of that in elementary school. And suddenly parent teacher conferences are involved. <laughs> and, 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 um, and so they said, that's not appropriate. So I said, I'll show you. Then I started hiding the books behind the textbooks because I'd already read ahead. Um, they realized, though, because I was that kid who would like prove the teacher wrong, not because I was smarter, but I read the book. So if you're going to teach from the book, like you can't say this is true and not this. If the book said, you know, like, so I just I played rules lawyer, essentially, from the textbook. Uh, and then they realized that because I had read ahead and I was getting good grades, if they just let me read, I didn't bother them. So it sort of worked. And then once I got to pick, I started reading um, David Eddings, the Belgarion series. Oh, sure. so I really loved that. That's when I first realized how cool it could be to turn into a wolf. Because if you remember, the, old, uh, the older wizard turns into a, a wolf to travel. Um, and his daughter, I think, was like a hawk. Or no, she was also a wolf, too. But, yeah, it was kind of cool. And from there, I, would, I went into the Choose Your Own Adventure, the um, – Oh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of them, but there was one where you were, it was um, not Dragonlance, but it was along those lines where it was um, game mechanics for a fantasy setting. Lone Wolf. There we go. It was the Lone Wolf series. There we go. That wasn't a TSR set, unfortunately, but I wrote a bunch of those. Yeah, I don't understand. Like, I tried to plan one out because I thought I that was like my gateway drug to how fun it could be to be creative. Uh -huh. And then I started like plotting these books and I'm like, this is where the serial killer meme comes from with all of the like lines of string connecting everything. Like yeah, if yeah. someone, if it's someone were a program that yeah. I could use to insert and follow the path and it just sort of naturally did it, uh -huh. like I could do it. But shy of somebody making a computer program to let me organize it. Like I'm no, my brain just breaks thinking about hey, it. You just tell me, and I'll be happy to send you a complete Choose Your Own Adventure outline that you can start to write a story on. I might do that just for the fun of it when I need my brain to. to when it's all done, I use it for any time they call me to write. I, I charge them five grand to write a Choose Your Own Adventure book because it takes forever. It takes I me believe. six to nine months to do it. So I've, I've got the outline all ready to go, and the outline will fit any, any book story. So I'll be happy to send that to you anytime you want. I will take you up on it when this interview is over because okay. uh, I'd be curious to see because I know a friend of the show, Robert Tilsley, who publishes his R.A. Uh, R. Max Tilsley for his children's stuff. Um, he did one um, where he quoted me about uh, a line about um, the, I make jokes about pineapple on pizza. I don't hate it as much as I say. It's just one of those fun things to get people started to get the hate mail because it's one of those things where there is no middle ground. You either love it or hate it, right? There's nobody's like, hey, it's okay. Yep. I'll eat it if there's nothing else. It's either, no, it's horrible or or it's the most divine thing ever. Yeah. And I'm so sure he, that's me. He, yeah, he has a, a no, line I, in there I, where, where the kids, the kid in the zombie apocalypse finds a pizza uh, in like a pizza kitchen that's still running because, you know, this is right after everyone's dying. And so he makes a pineapple pizza and that's what kills him. That's one of the death <laughs> endings that he added just for me. <laughs> funny. Very funny. So, yeah, I, I've been interested in it. We've talked about if we could figure out a computer program to organize that, we would totally crank out a couple of them just for the fun of it. Not that I expect to make a lot of money because unfortunately when you sell the kids, you're not really selling to the kids, you're selling to the parents. Yeah. Because kids yeah. don't tend to have credit cards. So right. and that makes that makes you know the kids market a lot more difficult. And you need more of an inside man at the libraries, and you know, that's where scholastic books comes in. Yeah. Um, but they're just fun. I've seen a couple of choose your own adventure romance novels where basically yeah. you can kind of we pick call them them you. books, and they were they were really big deal romances, yeah. Yeah, so I we, saw we it just we spent years trying to appeal to females, and it wasn't really until Dragonlance came out. That we we caught the female audience. The um, the problem with the uh, the choose your own adventure, pick a path, whatever you have to call them, so you don't get sued. Yeah. And I'll have to look it up before I publish anything in that regard. Is a lot of those when they were first coming out, Amazon would say, "Oh, you're trying to 
cheat the Kindle Unlimited program because if you have the path, if they pick the right path and they end up at the end of the book, the way they used to count it is if they started at book one and then they the first choice has them or whatever, the choice they make has them at the end of the book, you got credit for everything in the middle. Oh my. I don't, I don't think it's done that way anymore. It's based on the percentage of pages. Yeah. Um, but so they started hammering everyone that did it um, back when the only way to, to sell books was pretty much Kindle Unlimited. And so people stopped writing them. I think now the market is going away from KU a little bit. So hopefully you'll see more of those come back because they're fun. I'd be, I'd be glad to do a couple if they want to give me the decent money. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Kindle Unlimited is going to pay you uh, six grand, unfortunately. I don't think so either, no. Bezos is a little bit tight-fisted with that cash. Yeah, sure. So Scholastic, because you still have a – I know, JR, you still have a kid in school, I believe. I do. I have two of them in school, yeah. Two of them in school. Scholastic is the way that I got around being able to bring my horror books to school. So initially they were like, you cannot bring Stephen King to school. You cannot do that. Really? It's unacceptable. You cannot bring it. You cannot bring uh, the Langoliers or anything like that. Like, I was not, I was told no. And I'm like, my mom's a volunteer here. My mom's on the PTA. She said it's okay that I read them as long as I don't <laughs> read them to other kids. There we and I'm go. I'm not reading them to other kids. It's just for me. Mm -hmm. And um, they were like, no, you can't have any of that scary stuff. So my mom got the principal to sign paperwork off because at the time they were like, Hey, Marissa is not going to survive past 13 years old. She's, really? she's not going to survive past 13. She will not live past 13. It's not going to happen. I, I did not have a good prognosis early in life. So the fact that I'm 36 and still going, I'm very proud of myself. But <laughs> um, at that point they were like, just let her read what she wants to read. And for the longest time, that worked. But there were still a few of my teachers that were dead set on me not reading those books in school. And one teacher, she was adamant to the point she would snatch them out of my hand and, oh. keep them, and then hand them to my mom at the end of the day. Be like, she can't have this in my class. So that year for the Scholastic, because my mom was PTA and they did the Scholastic Fair and we all showed up. And that teacher was working the Scholastic Fair with my mom. And they were having a conversation. It was my mom, that teacher, and the principal. They're all having a conversation about, you know, how well the fair was going. And I went and started grabbing books off the shelves. Just all these different books. And I walked over and I was like, Mom, I have a question. And they're like, oh, we'll, we'll leave you guys alone. I'm like, no, 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 you guys can stay. I was like seven years old. podcast I'm doing. I was like, um, so... Goosebumps is okay in school, but Stephen King isn't because it's horror. Scary stories to tell in the dark. Those are really dark, but I can't read my Stephen King. And I started going through all these horror books that they had at the Scholastic Fair that you could buy and, and read at school. And oh, like, my. So these are all okay. But my Stephen King book is not. And absolutely nobody had an answer. And my mom just stood there smiling at me. And I was like, can I have my well, book back now? Do you, you want to know why it's different? Because Goosebumps could at least stick a landing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. King is his endings are a little. Hmm. I mean, you can't argue with success. The man basically opens his, his pen and prints money. But Oh, yeah. I tried to write make for Goosebumps and I couldn't get him to let me do it. <laughs> they actually make a joke about that in um, it number two, after the second one after the remake, um, when they all came back as adults to refight Pennywise again. Um, the main the main character is a um, he's a writer for his both books and uh, screenwriting his books into movies. His uh -huh. wife at the time was the main actress and everybody's like, I hate your endings. <laughs> I hate your endings. I hate your endings. And it is one of the only movies that Stephen King actually took a small part in. And he goes into this antique shop. The main character goes into an antique shop and the owner of the antique shop is Stephen King. Wow. And the, he's like, I think I know you. And he's like, huh? 
and he pulls out the the actor's you know book and slams it down and he's like oh do you want to sign it for me he's like eh no i don't really like your endings oh. <laughs> and stephen king says it about this book and everybody and everybody i guess when he like said it out loud the whole entire um movie crew was like oh my god yeah, really. He knows. He knows he's self aware. <laughs> wow. Well, they say his writing got different after one of the readers attacked him and he got hit by that car. And then I've also heard the joke that much like sobriety killed rock and roll, it killed Stephen King's fiction too. Um, because supposedly, I guess, in the early days, I don't know this is true. I'm not a huge I only read the books. I, I'm not a huge horror person. Um, I read them just to antagonize the teachers. That was not what I was reading at home. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so I, I was never their target audience. Um, I've been dragged into the world of horror reluctantly by Stabby because she wants, if she wants to sit through the podcast that I like on topics I like, I have to sit through some horror topics. So, have you ever written a horror setting for your for your games? Give me that again. Have you ever written a game like a horror setting for in modules or anything? Yep, for Castles and Crusades, I did a box set where um, you go to an end. And it's haunted, and the walls are bloody, and there's lots of horrible things happening. But that end sends you to a horror dimension where you have a great deal of difficulty getting out. I love okay. that. I'm here for that. There we go. I'm here this for was- that. So Castles and Crusaders is put out by Troll Lord Games, and they're uh, amazing people. They basically took the um, old white box style D and D. And then they added a castle siege engine to the background for like challenges. It is been recommended to me if I want to up my game from what I've been doing. Cause I've been running some swords and wizardry, which is essentially one E if I want to take that up a notch with modern mechanics that I should, I should learn castles and crusades. Uh huh. So it's, it's on my list to do. And we've talked to Steve Chenault about some of his product. He's, one of the owners at um, Troll Lord Games. They are a unique publisher with a unique problem. The problem is one of the owners is absolutely in love with books. So he he didn't like the way the publishing companies were printing. He didn't think it was superior quality. So he built a shed. And then in that shed, he built his own paper milling company to produce his own books. So like he's literally won awards for the paper he makes because he's so like, well, <laughs> He's so fanatical about, I'm trying to think of a way to say this. It isn't um, insulting to neurodivergent people like the terms I grew up using would have been for his his level of persnickety detail <laughs> to, the, to the little things from the amount of like the thickness of the paper to like the the weave of the, the binding that sews the pages together. He puts out a quality no, paper. We prefer neuro spicy. <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to remember that next time. But yeah, he is he is fanatical about that. Um, so I don't know that he makes as much on each book. He's spending more to produce it than like the print on demand model is that Wizards of the Coast and Amazon use. I think I've heard the only one that comes close to uh, Troll Lord Games for the quality of the actual book itself, not the content, just the physical book, would be uh, Black Library for uh, Warhammer 40k. They, they also do some really high quality actual book. Not like we're not talking about, we're not evaluating the content in this case. We're literally just the quality of the paper and the cover. And uh, those two. Goodman Games also equals Troll Lords in quality. You've written, isn't that who you wrote Giant Lands for? I've heard of them before. No, no. Giant Lands was a completely different guy. He came up to me one day and said, Hey, I got this great idea about putting giants um, in the world again. And it was a great idea. He paid me a lot of sweet dough, and I gave him a role playing game. There you go. Okay. I, um, that's what I do. I went to Barnes and Noble a couple weeks ago because every now and then, you know, I, I like old books. I like <laughs> going to old thrift stores and finding old books that you can tell were loved once upon a time. There we go. Their binding, their binding is frail, and you can see how many times it's been cracked open. Because then you know you're getting something good. You're like somebody loved this book once upon <laughs> a time, and. At Barnes and Noble, you don't get that. You're just taking a guess. You're like, this might be a good book. It might not, because every one of them is brand new. If you go into yeah. to an 
old bookstore, you know, and you see a brand new binding and it's been maybe cracked once, you're like, do I really want to spend money on this book? Because it doesn't seem like, you know, anybody's really taken the time to read it more than once versus the one that, you know, has been cracked and torn and dog-eared and everything else. But I went into Barnes & Noble and this was before October, because I know they put all the horror stuff and the, the true crime stuff out towards the front um, in October, because, you know, spooky season. But I want to say this was back in August or September, and I was just wandering around. I just needed to get out of the house kind of thing. I'm just wandering through there, and they have this huge setup of anthologies. And I was like, I love anthology movies. Maybe I like an anthology book. Maybe like let me take a look and I'm like looking at it and it is a lot of horror and and uh, and thriller anthologies out and I remember asking one of the Barnes and Noble lady I was like why wouldn't you save this setup until October this is a great setup don't get me wrong but seems like something you would put out like you know for spooky season or when everybody's in the mood for something spooky, you know? And she's like, no, this is what's big right now. Horror and thriller anthologies is what's big right now. And I was like, hmm. I was like, really? Did it meet your and, standards? Yeah. Well, the thing is, is with Barnes & Noble, I always feel like they're trying to, they, they try to shove their favorites down your throat. If they don't like you, you're not getting on the main table and main drag of the store. Yep. You're not you're not getting there. They're gonna put their favorites there, the people that paid a little extra money to be in Barnes and Noble. Yes, or they're not gonna, Yeah, they're not gonna put the little guy up there. So I wander into um into the actual aisles and uh, I was telling you, uh, JR, um that the mystery aisle at my Barnes and Noble, I'll have to take a picture of it next time I'm in there, I swear, is the best mystery aisle ever. Wow. They turn all the books backwards. <laughs> you have no clue what book you are grabbing. It is a complete mystery. <laughs> and I think that is so clever. <laughs> like, cool, the best yeah. Mystery ever. But I like to go and try to find authors that I've never heard of before. And I'd rather give my money to that author that I've never heard of sure. than, you know, Daniel Steele or, you know, so I actually, anymore. I don't mind used books, but unfortunately the used bookstores around here tend to want as much as if you're buying it new, which really stinks. If I don't mind getting used book, but I don't want to pay new prices for that. You know, uh, the funny Go thing is, is when you, when you get used textbooks and the way they highlight it, where I'm like, this guy clearly did not pass the class. <laughs> and you're looking at like what they highlighted in their side comments. Um, that's always fun. But when you get a brand new book that the pages still have to be cut and they've got that new book smell, there's just something about that. I'm a sucker for the old book smell. You have yeah. my great grandmother's cookbook. Have you I touched do. it She's yet? Uh, we, are, we have started scanning it. So she sent me her great grandmother's um, depression era um, canning recipe cookbook that we're scanning and digitizing and I'm going to, cause I've been canning food. So I'm going to try some of the recipes. And so I get to try it and she gets it digitized. So that way she can keep the, uh, original and still be able to use it. So, wow, cool. It was put out by the war department. Yes, it was, it was called canning during wartime, but have you actually touched it? Yeah. <laughs> It, it, I mean, I was trying to be very careful. I put white gloves on and everything. Um, I, I worked in the um, ancient uh, and rare book collection when I was a, uh, a graduate student as part of my um, work study deal. And um, my great grandma would be so mad at you. Don't put gloves on. <sighs> Enjoy the book. Yeah, but but your oils will break it down, and you want it to last at this point. That's why we're scanning it and digitizing it. Nope, she would be so mad. She said she always told me she goes, Marissa, I don't want them framed. I want them loved and shared. You have to fill the paper. It's there's a different feeling to the paper. That old old paper smell. That old ink smell. Oh, yeah, I love those books. Um, I'll, have, 
I, I do have another one to send you, but this one, good luck, because there's a few pages you are not scanning because you could tell she spilled syrup in it. And the check <laughs> <laughs> so, so, James, do you guys do any canning out there in cheese land? Uh, we do canning. I don't do canning, of course, but I do eat the results. <laughs> it's fair to me. I, I tried my hand at pickles, but I, I sent her some chili. I tried to do pickles, and they... I guess I my judge of a fresh cucumber was not what I thought it was because it went bad as I'm canning it. And I'm like, Ooh, nope, not eating this. Not good. Yeah. yeah. My wife loves the Walworth County Fair, and uh, and she always does baking and knitting and and uh, enter different, uh, different uh, places to get ribbons. And this year, she managed to get three blue ribbons. I was very pleased because nice. when my wife is happy, I'm happy. Smart man. So um, – we have a state fair, but it's not anywhere near me. It's one of those things that's on my list to go visit, to just to, to get the experience. Um, I'm told if you really want to go to a good state fair, you got to go to the one in Texas because they deep fry everything. There are companies that serve food that literally make all of the money they make in a year that one weekend. They're selling things like deep fried Twinkies. There's somehow they manage to deep fry beer. So like the bottle, like somehow the beer is inside in liquid, but it's deep fried on the outside. Don't ask me how that magic happens, but yeah. I've, 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 had a, I've had a deep fried Three Musketeers bar. Was it good? It was nasty. Yeah, the deep fried Twinkie I was not a fan. Deep fried Oreos. Oh, really? Okay. So we have a good. chocolate company here that doesn't deep fry them, but they uh, they dunk Oreos in dark chocolate and then they decorate them as a as a treat. Cool. Um, but I'm just, I don't know. The deep fried Twinkie was just almost too sweet. And that's what I, when I was at my fattest, when I weighed 380, I said, oh my, this is almost too sweet. So I can't imagine if I ate it now, you know, 60 pounds later, that I would be able to, like, my sugar tolerance is going down as I lose weight. Yeah. So I'm not a huge hot dog fan, but, <laughs> but in Texas, at, um, one of the, I don't remember where I was, but, uh, I went to one of their street fairs. It was just a street fair. It wasn't even like the big state fair. It was just a street fair. And there was a hot dog inside of a pickle deep oh. fried like a corn dog. Wow. And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm not a big fan of hot dogs, but I'm going to try this. Um, because there's a hot dog inside of a pickle inside of a corn dog. And that sounds interesting as heck. So I'll take one. It was so good. <laughs> so good. Crazy, huh? It was so good. It was like savory. There's nothing like a uh, – like a, we have <laughs> carnivals that will go through, even though we, I have never been to State Fair. There's nothing like carnival food, like for like corn dogs and stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's where I had the first time where the breakfast corn dog, where it's like pancake wrapped around sausage that with, yeah. with syrup coated. That was the like – I felt my arteries hardening, but it was worth it. <laughs> it tasted so good. Uh, how does this podcast always become the food show? I don't know, but we like always food. <laughs> so back to your story. So I noticed you've got a good mix of sci-fi and high fantasy. Um, is there any paranormal type stuff in your collection for this no, one? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I haven't done that yet, but I've got a couple ideas. You know how it is. How you, you write down the ideas and put it in a folder that you're gonna work on when you have time. <laughs> Everyone asks me, like, oh, how do you come up with ideas? And I'm like, no, no, no. The question is, how do you make them stop? Yeah, really? I have way more ideas than I have time to write. Um, I quite agree. Quite agree. And I, I'm told that gets easier as far as time goes. When As the kids get older, you have more free time. But still, like, the idea is just never – if I could just do – like, I don't want Neuralink because I've read too many sci-fi where that goes bad. One computer virus and you're gone. But if I could, like, do where it's external where you just put the cap on – and I could just like tell the story in my head and it just automatically translates to words, I would be the most prolific person ever because I got oh, the stories for days. Nice, yeah. It would. Me um, and Nick, um, our phones, our tablets, and our computers, because our office looks like an iMac or an Apple store. Huh. <laughs> so everything of ours, like all of his stuff is linked to his, all of mine is linked to mine, but we have our notes apps linked to each other. So anytime we make like a shopping list, it, the other person gets it and they can add stuff to it or when we get ideas. And um, right now we have six ideas in our notes, everything from a child being kidnapped by an alien 
and being raised by aliens to hmm. um, a couple that has been reborn multiple times in multiple um, facets, but they always find each other because of the red string of fate. Um, and then we have another one that is actually, uh, Caden brought it up and he's like, it's like, um, he's the great, great, great grandson of like, uh, Hawaiian Polynesian fire God, like a love <laughs> of God. And I was like, you know what, kid, you might be onto something. We need some more people in the universe. So let's go for it. So we have that one in there and it's constant between my random ideas. Cause I'll be watching something and I'm like, what if what if yeah we take this character this one character from this movie that i don't like the movie but i like this one character and we rewrite it but like this and then mm -hmm. nick's like i could draw that huh? i could draw that and he's like you write it and i'm like no i can't write it i'm dyslexic it won't make any sense so we've uh, we've gone all over the field we've talked about a lot of the high fantasy and the sci-fi uh, vibes that are in his collection. There's 18 stories, 100,000 words. You definitely should check it out. It's totally worth it. In the show notes, I will link to it on Bookapee, which James is a huge fan of that website as a place to buy books. It will be a universal link for uh, draft to digital which has all of the, because he is going wide with this one, so all the places, not Amazon, where you can buy books, you can buy that, and we'll have a link definitely for Amazon so you can check it out. Um, we've talked about all the games you've created, and you, you mo made me a list one time uh, for, for when we start doing the website where we could link to all the things, if possible, that are still in print. Um, did you own most of those games that you wrote, or did you do it work for hire? I don't No, I don't own many of them. I own one or two of them. Um, because I, I call myself the high price spread, I charge a lot. When I, when I write for people, and that usually means that I don't get a royalty. Okay. So, you know, there's there's a lot of games. You've written in a lot of iconic properties. Bless you. Young lady. Bless you. you. Is there any property or, like, franchise IP that you haven't written in yet that you would love to, if you could pick? Ooh, that's a very good question. Let me see. I Hmm. Well, I'd really like to do a big Western set of rules. I think that was fun. I played Boot Hill with TSR, and I really love that. And I think an underwater set of rules would be fun, too, dealing with uh, intelligent fish creatures. Okay. I think that could be a lot of fun. And there really hasn't been a set of alien rules. And I don't mean alien, the movie with Ripley. I mean set of, of UFO style aliens in, in a set of rules. There hasn't been that yet. Where you're the alien instead of the human? Yes, where you play the alien you have to deal with humans. Oh. I'd try that. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So like when you're you... just there for a pizza but the people think that you're there to take over. Why does everybody think I'm going to probe them? What is wrong with these people? <laughs> yeah, really. What can we learn from a fart? <laughs> the, the funny one is there's this picture of this. Uh, it's a UFO with the style, this typical saucer style. And this alien sitting there and the kid, little alien comes in and he goes, Dad, my science project is due. Oh, when's it due? Tomorrow. Why are you telling me at the last minute? And then all of a sudden they're beaming up somebody to probe them because they waited to the last minute. And that's <laughs> is the aliens are just like us. There we go. Times have your kids like, oh, the project? Yeah, it's due tomorrow. It's due tomorrow. That's what they do to us all the time, don't they? The I, I'd like to say I didn't do that to my parents, but I probably did. I know I did it to mine, and my, my three boys did it to me for sure. So I guess the curse is that we hope our, our grandkids will do it to our kids someday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> get our revenge. So you've talked about the kind of game you would like to design. If there was any property you could write in, like, you know, you've, you've done G.I. Joe, for instance, but if you wanted to write a story or a game in that or Stargate or, like, is there any that you haven't done that you would like to? I, I tried writing for Stargate. I couldn't talk them into it. I had a, a brilliant novel outline that I wanted to do. No, they weren't interested. Um, that, that's a great question. Um, I This is going to sound very strange, but... 
Uh, right now we're on Netflix and we're watching. Um, we are watching. What is the name of that show that we're watching? It's a police show. SWAT. We're watching SWAT. Oh, I'm watching that too. I just finished season six. Yeah, oh, yeah. Good. Well, we're on season three, but I've always wanted to do a card game where there, we have the different SWAT teams from all across the world because the Japanese do SWAT very different from the English and the Americans and the people from India. So they have all these different styles of SWAT. And I think that would make a great collectible card game. Okay. Are you thinking collectible card game like Magic's Gathering style? Yes, yes exactly. Okay. Those I, really, are I know people people in the industry, in the hobby industry, tend to say, oh, you, you can't beat the, the – uh, you cannot beat the Magic the Gathering franchise. But, you know, Game Boy had a great franchise. They were beaten. Laser Tag had a great franchise. They were beaten. I think it's very possible to come out with some more big hits in so, the franchise. I know we're actually, I know a guy who runs a company um, that, I, you know, we won't say it now, but we're going to be interviewing him. He's got a, a Kickstarter him and his family are running uh, for a card game like the Magic the Gathering. And they were inspired uh, partly by Wizards of the Coast cutting some of the um, druids and stuff because, oh, it's offensive to this person or that person. So mm -hmm. they're cutting out some of the most iconic, like, card types yes. because they're worried about hurting people's feelings. Yeah, like, none of it's real. Let them have their fun. Who cares? Uh, all, the, all the people on the left care. I know that's evil to say, but they're they're very woke and they they want to not offend anybody, which is really hard to do. But when you when you make those changes and you upset your player base, you end up with uh, holes in the market that nimble creators can fill. And so I, I suspect yeah. we're going to see more card games to replace it. And the other part of that is the newer ones, like the, the more established ones, the barrier to entry keeps getting steeper and steeper if mm -hmm. you want to compete. Whereas if you get in on the ground floor, it doesn't seem so intimidating. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and so 100%. I know people that won't read like The Four Horsemen or David Weber because, holy crap, there's a hundred of those books. Whereas if you had started with either one of them in the beginning, it doesn't seem so bad. Yeah. But then if you come David to it later, it's, the commitment David seems so huge. Yeah. David Weber is wonderful. He is. We've interviewed him before. The man can talk. Uh, yeah. he, he gives me a run for my money. Uh -huh. So, but uh, but yeah, we um, we're, we're expecting more. So I could see that. Um, do you have a certain theme you'd want to do for your card game? Well, the SWAT game I'd really like to do. That I think that would be terrific. I could also do a pretty excellent um, Pixie and Fairy card game too. So for the SWAT one, would it be SWAT? different SWAT teams competing against each other? Would it be? Yeah, one what, what it would be is, uh, you'd have a set of like 25 cards for each different SWAT group and stuff that the, the SWAT people do. Like um, in Japan, it's really heavily martial arts centered. So the cards in that set would be a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, martial arts moves. And in the American one, it's really high tech. You know, they, they're, they're doing laser sights on their, on their pistols and, and rifles and, and lots of other kind of tech. And uh, and so each group would have a different kind of batch of 25 cards, and you'd mix and match to put together the best SWAT team. So who, would there be a, a card deck that somebody would be playing to be the bad guy? No, you'd be SWAT team against SWAT team. Okay. And what, what you do is uh, you'd want to put – you want to make four different decks and sell them in a box set. So the people would buy. Oh, I want to be. I want to be the American SWAT team. And you'd have all twenty-five. Well, you'd have fifty cards. Usually, you put about fifty cards in a deck, a collectible card game deck. And so you'd have the American set and the Japanese set and the British set and you know some other set that's very kind of unusual. And and so you could you could um, battle each other to see who would be the superior set. And so if you play test it right and you and you design it right. It should be just about equal. So the, the neat thing that if you look at SWAT tactics, and it's come up before, and I've shared some content with it over on the Galaxy's Edge uh, fan club, but a lot of the SWAT tactics when it comes to crowd dispersal is the same tactics uh, that the Roman legions and the Greek phalanxes use as far as like locking swords and moving in unit with cohesion to sort of push the crowd back and, you know, intimidation through noise. 
it's crazy how the more things change, the more things stay the same when it comes to that. Oh, it really is. Plus, they got a great big batch of weapons that are, you know, non-lethal. So just well, I mean, yeah, just, come oh. on. <laughs> I mean, there's what? nothing. There's there's nothing really really original anymore. Like, oh. I'm not trying to be mean about that. Like, there's not much that's really original anymore. So it's being brutal, know, this, by the way. <laughs> Not not in that way. That's not what I mean. But he was talking about how, you know, the SWAT teams, the way that they go in is the same way that the Roman Legion march. Like, it's, it's just taking an old concept and making it fit the newer times, which is totally fine. But the perfect example is the newest TikTok trend that this new generation is doing. Because my, my 13-year-old brought it to me the other day. And he goes, okay, so the new trend is you try to write your name without taking your pen off the paper. You mean cursive? Like, you, you mean cursive. That's, no, like, but... Tragic, isn't it? Really sad. It, it's it's cursive, Caden. I bought you a whole book to teach you how to write cursive because the school doesn't, and you don't want to learn from me. So I bought you a book to teach you how to do that. Go get that book. And he went and got the book, and I was like, write apple that's the first word in there and he's writing it and his pen never leaves the paper and he looks at me and he's like oh it's sort of like you see that the the if i didn't see it it didn't exist fallacy that you get with a lot of the new kids when whatever comes out oh my god it's the first insert like a woman superhero and everyone that's been around for a while is like i will see you that and raise you and then there's like the whole litany of everything that came yeah, before really. it yeah. It happens over and over again. I remember trying to convince my mom that uh, Simon uh, and the Chipmunks was new when it came. <laughs> out. Even though when I watched it, it was the remake of the one she had watched as a kid. So my youngest son, he's in high. Well, right now he's 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 forty. But anyway, when he was in high school, he comes in one day and I'm playing the Beatles White Album, and he says. Dad, what is that music? It sounds really good. Yeah, I said, I know. They've been around for centuries. <laughs> it's, just, it's just that aha moment. You know, I'm really glad you're teaching your son how to do cursive. I think that's great. Well, I, I, they have him sign his name. They, they have to, um, in school, the only cursive that they have to be able to do is to sign the, um, like, the... Um, the rules and regulations saying oh. I will follow these rules and they oh. have to sign them. And most everybody like oh. I saw a sign in sheet at the front desk the other day of all the kids that were late signing into school. Mm -hmm. Everybody's handwriting is trash. <laughs> and I, I remember sitting there looking at it like nobody's is legible. Like I thought my kid was a special case because he is easily distracted and his handwriting is horrible. I'm like, you'll make a great doctor someday. <laughs> um, but no, I couldn't read any of the names and they weren't in cursive. They were just printed, but like everybody's handwriting was so awful. And I was like, why? <laughs> and the, the principal told me straight up, she goes, because ever since the pandemic, we don't use paper and pencil anymore. <sighs> Everything's on a computer. Everything's on a laptop. That's tragic. And so you kind of have to teach your own kid. You kind of have to make them sit down and write. Mm -hmm. Because, like, it, it's bad. It's so sad that the written word is just disappearing with the last generation. Yeah. I think as the world goes digital, there's going to be value, uh, extreme value placed on actual print copies of books. I mean, it's worth it to have them just as, if nothing else, like a, an investment, I think, in the future to have some of these classics. Um, that's one of the most prized possessions I inherited from my grandfather was the uh, complete written works of Shakespeare that were leather bound with, uh, with the gold foil on the edge of the pages. Yeah. And, and like they just don't make books like that anymore. My wife gave me that for my birthday. I loved it. It's, a, it's good. I've read it a couple times and now I put it away and nobody's allowed to touch it. They can just look at it. <laughs> we'll buy the, we'll buy the cheap copy they can throw away if, if they ruin it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we talked about what franchises you would like to uh, write in. Now you've written a lot of your own IP work that you've created. If, if one person, like if you could pick one person that said, you know, I'd really like to write a James Ward universe. 
what who would be the dream author to have come right for you? They don't have to be alive still. Ooh, like, uh, I adore Robert Heinlein and Roger Zelazny. Okay. They're two amazing writers. And of course, Gary, Gary taught me everything I know about role playing design. So I'd love to work with him again. I'll just have to wait until I croak so I can work up by his table up there. Okay. So did Gary actually work in uh, or write in any of your like Gamma World or uh, Metamorphosis Alpha? That's a very interesting question. Okay. So um, he, he would complain at me about things. So in Gamma World, I didn't have any mounts. I didn't have anything you could ride. And so, so one day he hands me like five sheets of paper. He says, these are all mounts that you can put in Gamma World. I said, oh, okay, Gary. <laughs> and then he would complain about the mutations that I had in my book. And, and so he, he always insisted I had one mutation. It was called, uh, it was called heal everything. So you take a bunch of wounds and one time a day you could heal them all up. But I said, Gary, I'm not putting that in the game. It's too strong. And so he wrote it in his Metamorphosis Alpha rule book. And he says, it's in my rule book, so I can use it. <laughs> it, it was kind of hard to argue with that. Because he was the father of role play. So did you actually incorporate it later or some yeah, version of it? And I put it in a bunch of Metamorphosis rules. Just <laughs> he said so. Okay. Now, I know you said you're about halfway through the next volume of short stories. Do you um, have a timeline for people that are interested? Boy, you know, it's a problem because I, I'm, I'm deep into this um, game light that you and I are working on right now. It's good. And it's fun. The Wizard of Sending series. Three books, there's three books in the series, and I'd really like to get that done before I do any other big deal writing projects. So we'll just have to see. Every once in a while, I get inspired. And I'll start something and just just save it to finish later. But yeah, I, I really want to get our, our novels. We we're doing four in the in the uh, in the what what do you call that series again? We're calling it the Curse Brigade because you vetoed all of my names and um, yeah. No, I not lost. the Curse Brigade. The other one we're doing. Oh, the Wizard Ascending series. Yeah. No. Yeah. The, it is the Curse Brigade. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there was four books in that one, and we're working on number two. So we have lots of writing projects we could be doing. Plus, you come up with a couple ideas that deserve their own novel. So, yeah, we did. Um, so I was, I got invited into. Well, I thought it was an invitation into a Paladin collection that New Mythology Press, which is part of the Chris Kennedy Publishing, was putting out. And I misunderstood. I was tired. I hadn't had my caffeine yet. It wasn't a hey, send me a story. I want your story. It was. Hey, there's an open call if you're interested, which are two totally different things. If I had known it was just an open call, I probably would have said my schedule is full. You know, I appreciate it maybe next time. But because I thought he'd ask me directly and, and Rob's done some short stories for me, I'm like, I'll return the favor. Let me give him a story. And so I was on my walk and I'm like, I wonder what would happen if a Templar became a vampire. And that sort of was the, the genesis of the story. Um, and so he's the, literally the last Templar, which required a little bit of research. Uh, and then research into vampires. And I realized that nobody agrees on any of the, the fantasy stuff, which makes it a lot more fun because people will argue to death the ballistic trajectory and you know all the stuff that's real. And you'll get the rules lawyers that will nitpick you and you've just got to like cross your yeah. eyes. And, or you know, was it cross your, yeah, cross your eyes and dot your teeth. Oh crap, I got it wrong. Anyway, I type <laughs> that people, don't hate me. Uh, and so I realized when we do fantasy, like I could just make it up and no one cares as long as it works for the plot. Sweet. Uh, and so we wrote a vampire story and I sent it to James. I'm like, look, I know I'm a slow writer. So you've been waiting on me. What do you think? Can you add something to it? And then you get a story with your name on it too. And he liked it. He made minor changes that made big differences. Uh, and James and I were talking and we're like, this, this could be a fun urban fantasy to explore. Like what happens if somebody from like 1291, which the, the last major engagement of the Templars was the fall of Acker in 1291. Uh, and then, you know, of course, from then until they were dissolved in 1312, they were just being persecuted by the Herod, heretical French King Philip. Um, I know we're going to get hate mail, but dude was weird. Um, and so like when I read the actual Pope Clement, the fourth, I believe released the, uh, the order that dissolved the Knights Templar. Cause they were basically France wanted all their gold that they had captured in the Holy land. 
and if you read it, it didn't dissolve, absolve any actual Templars of their obligation, their oath to God. It just dissolved the organization, presumably because they were all dead at that point. They had all been, you know, tortured by the French. Uh, what happens if there was one alive, hence the last Templar, because he was turned into a vampire? And we went with it. And then I was telling James, and he started giving me all these side plot stories. I'm like, James, you're, you're outlining a novel. I just need a short story. And we decided... <laughs> If we run out of time and things are right, we're going to definitely play in that world because, you know, uh, the the God of the 1200s is a lot different than the God of the modern churches uh, in the way it was interpreted by the the followers and the lady and, the, and the, the priesthood. It could be fun to play with, right? <laughs> you know, just uh, it would be as disruptive as Jesus was when he flipped the tables over at the uh, at the temple, right? It would be um, it'd be something else to see. Of course, how you do that and don't make a lot of religious people mad, I don't know. That that's the that's the rub. So that's what James is here for, to make sure that my heathen ways don't offend anyone. <laughs> this, this guy, his fantasy is getting much, much better since the beginning. You know, he went to me a lot, and now he can do like almost all of it all by himself. Yeah, we came up with a whole life cycle of a zombie just for the fun of it when we were doing the Wizard Ascending. Because, you know, there's all different kinds, and I wanted all of them to work. So it's it's definitely a lot of fun. So I, I'm enjoying it. I, I think I might do some more fantasy once I finish the open mill sci-fi series, just because it sounds fun, just to, to mix it up a little bit. But all right, so we've talked about the book. We've went far afield just getting nerdy, and I enjoyed every second of it. <laughs> um, your collection, Wolfoid, is out. It's 100,000 words, 18 stories. Some of them you've probably never seen before because they're not in print and haven't been for a little bit of time. Uh, <clears throat> X number of years. We won't say. James does not like to be told. Oh, my goodness. I, I admit that I'm older than Stone. I admit that. Before we let you go, James, is this age appropriate? Like, what would you say the age range is for someone who would be okay with this collection? Uh, it's definitely YA and up. I, I wouldn't have any problem with my grandson Noah at nine years old reading all the stories. He tells me, um, Stabby, that I am not allowed to cuss as much when I write. He has called me. We have had long conversations where he lectures me that one F-bomb to get the point across, but not 12 in a row. Let's uh, like, just we talk. The record is three F-bombs in a row. And I said, absolutely not. It's, it's okay. like, how? So when we go offline, <laughs> I will show you. Oh, I sneak the F bomb into our shows. Really? I won't tell you while we're recording because if somebody finds out, if they mm -hmm. find out and they figure it out, that means that they watch the whole episode. I see. Okay. So, well, I'll, I'll wait to hear secret. it. I'll look for it. With, so with, I'll show you. You know, I'm with my, that? fortunately for me, JR makes a very good point that, that soldiers, real soldiers and real armies, Swear a lot, so I a had to lot. put some of it, but I didn't want to put up with all of it. And and so we just let we let our editors be the tiebreaker if he thinks I overdid it. The hard part is making the Australian reader like we're writing some Australian characters. They use the c word like we use the f word. Um, yes. If you know, you know. But if I wrote that, Amazon would like crap the. It would be over. They were like, "This is not okay. We're on publishing it. We hate you. Don't talk to us anymore. And we're taking your money back." I mean, they would be really upset. There we go. Yeah, you you have to be careful with the see you next Tuesday. Absolutely. So <laughs> that being said, it's uh, eighteen stories from all over the eras that are uh, that are James Ward. They are amazing. My mother loved every minute of it, and she doesn't normally read this stuff, but she was like reading it a bunch. I will be reading it. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll have to talk about it as a review episode because there's so much. I mean, 18 stories to sink your teeth in all over the place. So check it out. Links are in the show notes, and you don't have to buy it on Amazon if you don't like Zuckerberg and, and Bezos and the crowd. You can buy it at Barnes & Noble. He won't hate you. You can the buy it at Barnes & Noble? Yeah, you can buy it digitally at Barnes & Noble. Oh, okay. digitally. You mean on Kindle? Yeah. Uh, Kindle is Amazon. Barnes & Noble has the Nook. Oh, okay. But uh, Barnes and Noble does a print on demand, so they can sell it in hardcover, hardcover too. Neat. So you wanted wide, you went wide, but you build an audience before Amazon was the only game in town, really. That's so true. you've got readers all over the place, which helps. Speaking of that, did you get the book I sent you? Not yet. You didn't. I sent it two weeks ago. 
I will call the postman and I will read him the riot act. Okay, good. With that being said, James, how can listeners find you on the wild, wild interwebs? And I will link to this all in the show notes. You know, I, and I, it, it's unfortunate, but I really hate trolls on Facebook. So I have 5,000 friends and I, I don't let anybody else in on my page. So I'm hard to get a hold of. I did, thanks to you, I did an Amazon page um, with my books, but I, yeah, I'm not easy to get a hold of. I'll answer questions in the forums. You get on Metamorphosis Alpha, you get on Gamma World, I'll be happy to answer questions. And I'm making a new Facebook page that's just going to talk about role playing. And then you'll be able to get a hold of me, but it isn't quite finished yet. Okay. All right. And uh, before we let you go, dear listener, this is the part where we remind you to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platform. Your reviews help the right readers find the right book. So do your part. James loves reading all the thoughtful reviews about how awesome he is. Uh, if you don't say nice things, he just, he'll probably skip it. But if you say nice things, he might respond. Um, I did, yeah. The guy, the who, the first guy who wrote a, a review of Wolf Voids, I, I sent him a letter right away thanking him for the, his intelligent response. That is that is very, very kind. And so we will link to James in the show notes. I will pull the Twitter because apparently that is not him. Who knew? They nice. used your picture though, sir. Yeah, great. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't okay it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find us on our link tree, which is l i n k t r dot e e link tree slash blasters and blaze podcast, where we link to all the things: the bit shoot, the rumbles, the twitters. We link to our Facebook group and Facebook page. You can follow, uh, email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail uh, If you want to send hate mail, uh, Stabby is linked in there as well. Madam Stabby Stab on the twitters and the insta. She does respond pretty quickly. Um, I, I did out some of the, the jokes uh, Nick told, and so she had to threaten to stab him uh, officially, which the, the viewers on the, the website seem to enjoy. Um, th they might not like Nick. I don't know what's going on there, Stabby. Well, <laughs> no, we like they, Nick, like, no. they like Nick. They just didn't realize that he was married to a crazy person. Oh, there we go. Him and Michael Myers both. You can find us on anchor.fm, which is our temporary website because we are working on blastersandblades.com, but anchor.fm slash blasters, tack and tack blades. Again, anchor.fm slash blasters, tack and tack blades, where for as little as 99 cents a month, you can help keep the lights on. Or you can support the show more directly at buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com slash author jr hanley be sure to put in the comment section that it is for the podcast and i promise i will keep my co-host duly caffeinated on coffee brand coffee uh she will be drinking all of the blueberries and strawberries and cream coffee that they will produce uh we might even need a 12-step group for her at this point it's it's gotten ugly uh which if you want to do that we do have the code to get a discount podcast grunts over at uh, coffee brand coffee uh, but uh we would they have tea and co hot cocoa as well um I have tried hot cocoa recently. It was, uh, they called it European sipping chocolate, which is apparently different than hot chocolate. It was very decadent. I felt like I needed to say a few Hail Marys afterwards. It was, it was very rich. Pinkies out. Pinkies out. That's right. That's right. All right. So, uh, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us for my crazy co-host. I am Jared Hanley and this was the blasters and blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes and all things that go boom. Thank you for stopping by James. Sorry. We went long. Well, sorry, not sorry. Cause we had fun. My pleasure. All right. And that's a wrap people. And we are out now.